Welcome to the conversation series of the Asia Center for Social Entrepreneurship and Philanthropy at the National University of Singapore Business School. Our guest for today is Professor Mohammed Yunus, who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for his work in the establishment of the Grameen Bank. Professor Yunus is a world acknowledged expert and his ideas have influenced developments today that can be found in virtually every nation of the world. We began our conversation by asking Professor Yunus to think back to the beginnings of his ideas and how those ideas actually came to be as he worked with poor villagers in his native Bangladesh. Well, Professor Yunus, welcome to the National University of Singapore Business School. We're very pleased to have you with us. You've been called, of course, the banker for the poor. Uh, many of the microfinance activities can be found in over 100 countries around the world. In terms of the genesis of your ideas, as we think about people wanting to launch a social enterprise or social business, how do you really arrive at those kind of crystallized ideas that led you to actually launch the work that you've done in microfinance? Well, thank you for inviting me and uh, for this conversation. Uh, let me just uh, point out, you mentioned uh, more than 100 countries are involved in microcredit. I would say almost every single country today. It's very difficult to find a country where microcredit has not spread in. It began um, not as a microfinance, not as banking. It's a kind of a, a response to a local problem in a tiny village in Bangladesh. Uh, I was a teacher teaching economics in the classroom in a university in Bangladesh. Country was going through a famine and it frustrated the young teacher trying to see if he can do something useful to the people uh, in a day-to-day -day way in the next door village uh, and did a lot of tiny little things and then saw the loan sharking in the village and uh, I thought this is such an intricate problem this is beyond my capacity to solve but I can do something in this village uh, for these few people why don't I lend myself rather than let the loan shark lend it so it's kind of replacing the role from the loan shark, I want to do it a genuine lending program. I did that from my own pocket, so I had no idea of that it is banking or anything, just replacing the loan shark. And then the sensation that it created in the village got me in. Uh, the question that came to my mind that if you can make so many people so happy with such a small amount of money, why shouldn't you do more? So I wanted to do more. And that led me to thinking of bringing the bank to lend this because bank is right there in the campus. Uh, I talked to the bank, bank said no, impossible, uh, we can't do that, it's, it's not our job, uh, let others do it, we can't handle lending money to the poor people. So that kind of agitated me, it started a series of debates with the bankers, shouting at the bankers, finally at the end after about eight months I offered myself as a guarantor. I said, I'll be the guarantor, you give the money, I take the responsibility and so on. And that was the beginning in 1976. And it worked. And as it worked, it grew to the next village and next village. Then bank was becoming reluctant as it was becoming bigger. So I said, why don't we create a separate bank? If it works, if these banks don't want to do it, I want to do that. So we create, it was not easy, but after a while, we succeeded in creating a new bank in 1983 called it Grameen Bank or Village Bank, and then it started spreading it all over the country. Today, Grameen Bank works all over Bangladesh, in every single village of Bangladesh. There are 80,000 villages in Bangladesh. We have 8.3 million borrowers, or nearly all of them are women, 97% of them are women, and they own the bank. It's not a bank owned by somebody else. 97% of the shares are owned by the borrowers, and entire money that we lend out comes from within the bank. We take the deposit and lend money to the poor people. Now we run a pro, uh, banking program in New York City. We have uh, four branches in New York called Grameen America. And then uh, it works so well, uh, we, have, we are being invited to other cities. Now we work in Omaha, Nebraska for two years. And then uh, last year we started a new branch in uh, Indianapolis. This year, just about a couple of months, we will start a branch in uh, San Francisco. The next one is in line is Detroit. So it's a spreading even within the United States. This illustrates a problem that sometimes comes up when you talk with people in social enterprise. One of the issues, of course, is about scaling. Your concept is an example of something that really did scale, and it really relatively scaled quite rapidly to a fairly large level 
as you think about that particular aspect, you know, what were some challenges in that scaling exercise that you had to overcome? It's the courage. People need courage to scale. Uh, not only Grameen Bank has scaled as a national program all over the country. If you come to Bangladesh, there are almost the size of Grameen Bank. There are other programs called BRAC. It's an NGO. It is all over the country. The ASHA is another big one, almost as big as a BRAC, uh, all over the country. So it's not singular examples Grameen has done something. Grameen example is it's owned by the borrowers. It's run as a commercial enterprise because it has to earn profit and profit goes back to the Other two are NGOs, but they follow the same principle, same way. They say it's sustainable, it works out. So it's a question of somebody who's to make a decision. I want to grow because if one unit, call it a branch, uh, we call it a branch. If one branch works in a sustainable way, then it's done. You can create as many branches as you want. Problem may be money. Who is providing the money? So if you, somebody is providing the money, we created the source of money in Bangladesh that helped uh, those NGOs, but they didn't depend on that source that they have. They started taking money from the other banks and lend money. Uh, we created a wholesale fund in Bangladesh so that every NGO can borrow money from that wholesale fund. We call it PKSF in Bangladesh. And they can borrow money from that uh, organization and lend money to the poor people. So the money was never a constraint in Bangladesh. So I, I, I will conclude by saying that, yes, it can be done. It's a question of uh, making that decision and then find a source of uh, funding. To some degree, some of what we've seen happening in the microfinance world writ large has taken us back to where you began, where you were replacing that local loan chart. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are your thoughts at this point about what governments and what non-governmental entities really should be doing to really rein in some of this bad behavior that is, seems to be giving a bad name right now right, to exactly. the microfinance arena? Sure. Uh, we uh, want to make sure that where we draw the line, what is microcredit and microfinance and what is not. Uh, because we created the idea of microcredit, microfinance uh, to help people, poor people, particularly poor women, get out of the troubles that she is in so that her family could have a better income, the children have better food and so on. So that was the entire intention. The intention of making personal money out of this never entered our mind. So that's what we understand when we say microcredit or microfinance. But some people took this idea, technology of it, and turn it around, move into the loan shark direction, make a lot of money from the poor people. And that's the mission drift that have caused all this problem. So we have to go back and draw that line, and we tell them, those who are doing that, tell them that don't use the word microfinance or microcredit for your, for your uh, business. You call something else, because microcredit and microfinance, these words <clears throat> bring a lot of respectability, a uh, lot of credibility, because it helps poor people. You're using this respectability and credibility to make money for yourself. So I keep reminding that these are two different business completely. So have a different name for yourself, and we draw the line where it departs. So that's the only way. If they want to be on that side, let them be on that side. I cannot stop them. But when you say microcredit, this is what we understand. It is dedicated to solving the problems of the poor people by offering them financial system, financial services in a way affordable to them so that they can do the maximum benefit. Maximum benefit goes to them. People always want to know, for somebody who wins a Nobel Prize, yeah. you know, what is it like to get the phone call? Can you talk a little bit about, a little bit about the feelings that I'm sure are still <laughs> quite there with you, and also how it's impacted you personally and how it's impacted the kind of work that you were carrying on? Well, it's, it's an amazing thing to uh, have a prize like a Nobel Prize. Uh, you cannot imagine it before you, it happens. Uh, you can think about all the thing that uh, possibly will happen, but still it's still not anywhere near what actually happened. The whole world attention immediately is on you. This is such a prize that the entire world has got glued into it. The day it is announced, every single newspaper in the world makes it a front page news, and every TV channel is at the first news and the announcements and so on, and your, not only the announcement, it's your bio, it's what you have done, how you did it. And I don't think any human being can get so much of attention uh, in a lifetime. 
So that's an amazing thing. And, and, and it begins at the peak and it continues. It's not disappearing next day. So the attention level and the respect level, it goes all the way up and so on. So this is enormous, uh, whether one deserves it or not, it's not even question. Uh, so much uh, attention, so much uh, uh, kind of uh, glory to a person to come through a one single prize, whether the all lifetime works is equivalent to that. But that's the way it has been. It's a, a wonderful privilege to have that. And while the attention is there, uh, you may make use of it because you, every one of them either doing something or saying something to make things happen in the world. Uh, so while this attention level is on, you can now uh, bring the message a much wider audience than you did before. Same thing probably you said day before the prize was announced. Nobody listened to you. Nobody paid attention. The next day you say it, every single person heard it loud and clear. Even if you say it in a whispering voice, it's very clear all over the world. So that's the kind of advantage that you have uh, so that a Nobel laureates can use that facility to communicate to the world that what is indeed important for humankind. There's a lot of people focused on a target that by 2050 will have reduced poverty in the world by half. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about that and what makes you feel that way? My looking at it by 2050, Poverty should be over, not half. It's completely over. There's nobody should be a poor person. It's 2015 we are talking about reducing poverty by half. And we are on the track. Many countries on the track. Bangladesh is one. And many Asian countries will achieve that. There are eight Millennium Development Goals. And number one goal is to reduce poverty by half by 2015. The question is, what happens next? When will poverty come to zero? And in Bangladesh, I'm promoting the idea that we should be setting 2030 as the year where it should be zero. And also encouraging the United Nations to come out and say that in the next phase of Millennium Development Goal. So yes, I very much believe that it can happen. Look at Singapore. Singapore, everybody was poor. 25 years, 30 years back. You could go around trying to track down one poor person today. So if Singapore can do it, any country can do it. Look at all the rich countries in the world, every single country. You go back 50 years, 100 years, they were poor, they were starvation. People leaving the country because they are dying in famines and so on. But today, rich countries. So it's, 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 a, it's the way the progression is made, it's the way things happen. Today, that rate of change is fa much faster because of the uh, integration of the economy of the world, uh, globalization, technology and uh, innovations, uh, making uh, uh, connectivity so much easier, almost costless uh, connectivity, uh, speed of uh, communication, the speed of transportations and all that. So all these things will be collapsed in a much shorter period today, which took century, it will take a decade today. So as you think about this, obviously one player in all this action are social businesses. And there's been a great increase of interest and in the genesis of these sorts of enterprises. If you were going to start today a social business, what sort of areas would come to your mind? What kind of businesses would you actually launch? Social business, uh, first of all, is a mission-driven business. It's a problem-solving business. The, the distinction between profit-making business and social business is in a profit-making business, somebody is investing money in a business to make more money for himself or herself. Uh, so it's a personal gain-oriented business. Social business is not personal gain-driven, is a solution-seeking uh, business. Now, in what area it will be applicable? Any problem. You think of a problem, create a business to solve that problem. It could be any kind of problem. It could be poverty as a problem, create a business to solve the problem of poverty. Health is a problem, create a business to solve the problem of health. Why is business? Why can't charity do that? That's a traditional way we used to do that. We still do that. We give money to the hungry, we give money to the sick, we give money to the people uh, who don't have education so that they have education. This is the charity mode. If you don't have a job, I give you money so that you can survive. Government gives money, call it welfare, so that you can take care. That's the charity mode. I said each one of them can be done in a business way. It becomes sustainable. Same money can work and work and rework and recycle again and again. So you get more benefit. That's the whole idea of social business. 
today you can do it uh, in poverty reduction, social business, job creation, social business. So you look at anything, drug, you are on drug or children are on drug, you create a social business to pull them out of drug. Uh, or drinking habit, alcoholism, create a social business out of that. You may think, can you do such things and everything can be done? And I believe so, but I don't have a ready formula. We don't have a off the shelf. But creative mind can find all those solutions if you think in that direction. That's what the beauty of social business is, make you think. It make you bring your creative ideas. It make you bring your technology because technology is moving very fast. But why can't we take this and solve this problem? We are not doing that today because technology is running to make money. This is a different route. So you have to pull that technology to this direction so that we can solve the problem. So that's the idea of social business. And now we, we have already uh, set up many social business in, as a joint ventures with big companies. We have joint ventures with Danone to produce yogurt to solve the problem of malnutrition in Bangladesh. We have joint venture with Adidas to bring shoes very cheap, under one euro, uh, uh, Reebok shoes in Bangladesh, uh, so that nobody goes barefoot, nobody has parasitic diseases because of barefoot. Now NUS, National University of Singapore, is organizing a big forum tomorrow on social business, so that the business community and the executives and the students and the faculty members can discuss what can we do here in Singapore as a social business. In many other areas, this is happening in Japan and Europe, we hold social business, global social business summit every year. Uh, the fourth global summit will be taking place in Vienna this year from November 8 to 10. Bring all the CEOs who are already involved in social business, uh, all the CEOs who are about to begin social businesses and so on, and the faculty members, the students, and uh, uh, policy makers, media, uh, NGOs who would like to shift some of their activity into the social business side because it becomes more uh, sustainable, like microcredit you just mentioned previously. So if you think about sort of these classic sectors within society, government, the, the nonprofit sector, the charitable sector, right, the for-profit sector, uh, your vision of this future, you know, what's the relative balance then between these sectors and what way do you see that shifting then over time? Now, human capacity increases when you bring more options. So you keep on adding options. So it will all depend on which option suits to your feelings, what you want to do, express yourself. So it all depends on what, as a human being, we want with our life. We want to make billions of dollars as a person, that's the purpose of life, and then you take the for profit, choose, choose this. Or do you want to change the life of everybody around us? Then you take another route. Uh, or you have a mixture, you want to make money, also change. So it's a which proportion you want to do that. You want to make changes by giving charity, fine, you do the charity route. You want to do it in a business way, but don't want to take any money out of it because it's all dedicated, then you're the social business way. You want to mix the profit and the social idea, then the impact investments and all those things can be done. So there are options after options. Uh, social business is one option, very clean option, is no, is a delinked from personal profit totally. Company makes profit, profit stays with the company. It's a non-dividend company, so it's very clear. Then in between profit maximization and non-dividend company, you have a whole mixture between the social and profit. Whether 99% profit and 1% social, or 99% social or 1% profit, you decide. It's a whole spectrum, you can locate yourself. These are the options available. So what will happen will depend on what you want, what I want, what you want. That's all it will be. So we cannot say this will be bigger than this, we don't know. Maybe the whole thing will be for profit, everything will be forgotten, yes, that's an option. Maybe everything will be social business, everything else will be forgotten, that's an option. Maybe everything will be charity, but then where is the money coming from? So these are the questions we have to address and make it happen. I know one of the things that people in Asia tell me about these kind of more hybrid sorts of models and things where we're mixing profit, non-profit, for-profit, low-profit, no-profit, <laughs> et cetera, right? that regulation itself is a barrier in some of these countries and that the law only seems to recognize a totally for-profit or a totally non-profit and really doesn't allow for much in between. What are some lessons you see perhaps from other places that Asian policymakers could really take to heart? One of the message we give to policymakers, so far as social business is concerned, as I define, that please don't give us any favor. We 
uh, any favor, any special privilege for social business is not allowed. Let them function as a business. Whatever regulations you have for any other business, you apply the same thing. Whatever taxes you charge for any other business, tax it. Whatever uh, restrictions you give, put them restrictions. So we don't need any special favor. A special favor is always a negative thing. The moment you give any special favor to anything, wrong things will definitely happen there. Because some smart guy will come to take that special benefit in the name of the thing that they are doing. So I said it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of disease. We want to stay out of it. So we are protecting ourselves by denying any kind of special benefit. So if everybody can work like that, uh, those who are mixing, we are absolutely the other side, where we are not taking any dividend at all in the social business. So if you can survive that, if you are mixing profit and uh, social objectives, you can survive that too. And I will advocate, I will recommend that for God's sake, don't ask for any special privilege. The moment you do a special privilege, somebody will create trouble for you making use of your idea to make personal money for them. And that's not a good thing for this. So to keep it straight for across the board is the best solution. As you think about this, if you met an Asian philanthropist who wanted to give a prize, if you were going to advise that very wealthy individual, you know, what sort of prize would you establish? Well, since I'm uh, biased, uh, I would say uh, open a social business design competition ask the people to design, not do it, just design a great idea of a business to solve a problem without giving any dividend, make it sustainable, make it everything, but very effective in solving that problem and everybody's convinced. So who is at the top of that uh, uh, competition? Give them the price as the investment in that company. Let it work and see it, it happened. So the price should not be just for the honor that you have done. Price should be to make you think and do it and we'll applaud and that's your price. This is your company you created and I invested in it. That's it. This is one way to encourage people to come up with creativity. People have enormous creativity. Simply we didn't know how to use that creativity. This is one way to use that creativity. So if somebody wants to give the prize, I think this is a good way to do that. Any final words of advice you'd give to that aspiring individual out there? Young person, older person, maybe somebody actually quite on in years, um, who has that spark of imagination, that creative impulse. Well, the creative impulse is everybody has that. It's, a, it's a in, in, inside of every human being. It's unlimited capacity. Uh, it's a question of addressing that capacity. First of all, to become aware that I have unlimited capacity. Uh, once you are becoming aware, then the question is, how do I use it? For what purpose should I use it? So assuming that I have that power and believing that I have that power, I think the next big question is, what use do I make it for? And once I can answer that, then everything can follow from there. And that's where we can see that all the problems that we see around the world is nothing in front of the human creativity. Human creativity is much more powerful than if putting all the world's problems together in one basket. It's just cannot stand next to each other. So that's a human capacity. But we are not using that capacity. We forget. We have the huge power, but you use for only tiny little things. Personal interest. That's our tiniest thing. That personal thing can be used, but other things can also be done. But we don't do that because our theories, our books, our textbooks don't tell us that. All they tell you that go ahead and do business, make money, and so on. So we became money makers. World has become money chasers. The world is made up of money chasers. And that's the wrong thing. We are not just money making robots. We are human beings with enormous capacity. We can change the world anytime we want. If we say that money making, yes, but at the same time, much more powerful ability that we have to solve all the problems. Well, thank you for your inspiring insights and sharing with us today here at NUS. Thank you.